All right, so right off the bat, I'm just gonna let you know this video is going to be a bit different than my usual ones. So normally it's just a grain to glass and a complete life cycle of the brew to the actual beer um, and the tasting. I'm not gonna be able to do that this time though, but because I'm doing a Russian Imperial Stout this time, uh, and that is a very strong, very roasty, uh, complicated beer that needs a long aging period for its flavors to settle out and mellow out so it's drinkable. Um, I'm actually going to just do the brew day video and then later on I'm talking like six, seven months down the road uh, when this is actually aged properly and I put it into bottles, then I'll do the tasting video. And I'm gonna link these two videos together. So this beer is one of my favorite styles. It's something that I wanted to brew for a long time, but it is a very difficult beer to get right um, because there's just so much stuff in it and because there's so many intense flavors. You've got roastiness from a huge helping of roasted grains and black barley. You've got high alcohol content, which has its own flavor additions. You've got diacetyl from the yeast. You've got an aging period to figure out. You've got high hop bills. I got 80 IBUs in this recipe. There's a ton of balance that's needed in this beer. And it's extremely difficult to get all that right. And just be forewarned, um, this is not a beer that I've had a lot of experience with. Um, the last time I made one of these, I underpitched the yeast and I ended up with a lot of nasty esters that didn't belong in that beer. Um, and I also didn't age it for a long enough period, so it was still pretty harsh and accurate when I was drinking it. I didn't enjoy that experience. This time, we're gonna do that aging period right, we're gonna pitch the yeast correctly, and I'm gonna follow a dedicated recipe, um, a recipe that is not my own development, but rather one that I picked out from an expert who's won competitions using this recipe. So hopefully, assuming that I brew it correctly, it'll come out and be pretty good. I'm not entering any competitions, I don't really do that, um, but if the beer is a competition winner, it should be okay for me to brew it. I don't have the same setup that this guy has, so obviously there's going to be some differences in process. Well, that make enough of a difference to change the actual results, but hopefully not by much. So yet another complication factor to this whole thing is the fact that my brew kettle uh, is 11 gallons in capacity. So what that means is that on a normal brew day, when I have about less than 20 pounds in my grain bill, um, the hot break that comes out of that when you reach a boil is manageable just, just below the rim. So usually I'm uh, not concerned about a boil over, uh, but it does have to be managed for a normal five gallon batch. Now with a Russian Imperial Stout, we have an enormous grain bill. Uh, some of the five gallon recipes that I looked at had grain bills that were 25 to 30 pounds. So because your system will lose efficiency with a bigger beer uh, like this, you need to actually compensate with extra grain. So we're talking an enormous grain bill. Um, and the bottom line of that is, I don't have enough space in my kettle to brew a five gallon single batch of this without having a boil over and otherwise disastrous results. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to brew a smaller batch. So we're gonna scale things down to a 20 pound grain bill for four gallons of uh, eventual wort that's gonna come out. Now, I have to age this for a long period of time, which means that if I put four gallons of wort into my uh, seven gallon fermenters, I'm going to end up oxidizing the beer over time. So I need to scale that down further and put it into my three gallon fermenters to age so there's no head space. Well, I want more than three gallons of Russian Imperial Stout by the time I'm done with this process. Um, so I have two three gallon fermenters. We're gonna do this whole process twice. I am gonna brew the exact same recipe for four gallons twice. Each of those four gallon batches will be fermented in each of my large seven gallon fermenters. And then I'm gonna transfer them to a secondary fermentation stage in my three gallon fermenters. Therefore, there's no headspace to worry about oxidizing my beer with. So at the end of this process, I'm gonna brew a total of eight gallons of wort and have a total of six gallons of Russian Imperial Stout by the time we're done. Um, that way I can actually enjoy this stuff because there's a ton of work that's gonna go into this. That being said, I'm only really gonna probably film the first actual batch that I do because the second batch is going to be identical. Yeah, I will, however, let you know about uh, any sort of differences that happen in the second batch. So there's probably going to be a little bit of variance between the two, and that's fine. Uh, when it comes to bottling day, uh, which will be six or seven months in the future, 
I'm going to actually blend the two totally fermented, totally aged beers in my bottling bucket. I'm going to add some fresh yeast, which is going to help with the bottle conditioning. And uh, at that point, I will upload a totally separate video uh, for the tasting. But in the meantime, this is just going to be batch number one. And then I, get, I guess I'll let you know what's going to happen with batch number two at the end of the video. So enough babbling. This is the recipe that I'm using. Um, it's going to be 16 pounds of British pale malt, a pound and a half of black barley, three quarters of a pound of chocolate malt, three quarters of a pound of special B, half a pound of crystal 120, and half a pound of Caramunic. Um, and that gives us an estimated original gravity of uh, 1.120. That is a huge number that I'm definitely not going to hit because my system just loses efficiency when the beers get larger. So uh, I'm hoping to at least get to 1.100. Um, if I'm a little below that, it's not a big deal. Um, for hops, we're gonna go with uh, an ounce and a quarter of Northern Brewer at 60 minutes, three quarters of an ounce of Northern Brewer at 30 minutes, half an ounce of Northern Brewer at 15 minutes, three quarters of an ounce of East Kent Goldings at 15 minutes, and three quarters of an ounce of East Kent Goldings at five minutes. With a lot of hop presence in this beer, uh, because there's so much malt and it needs balance. So for use, we're going to use two totally rehydrated US05 packets. Uh, for water, uh, I'm shooting for a total uh, in parts per million of 66 parts per million of calcium, 12 parts per million of magnesium, 65 parts per million of sodium, 77 parts per million of sulfate, 118 parts per million of chloride, and 81 parts per million of carbonate. So that gives us a relatively balanced profile with a little bit more emphasis towards a multi beer, um, and then there's a significant helping of carbonate in there to try and keep my mash pH from getting too acidic uh, because of all the roasted grains. So in order to achieve those totals, I'm adding two grams of gypsum, two grams of epsom, one gram of calcium chloride, and two grams of calcium carbonate to my uh, mash water. And speaking of the mash, we're gonna go for uh, 151 degrees. Uh, we're gonna do a single infusion mash for 90 minutes, and that hopefully will give us enough time for a uh, full conversion. I do wanna squeeze as much sugar out of this grain as possible, uh, simply because I'm trying to hit a super high original gravity. We're really gonna only expect to get down to a final gravity of like 1.030, something like that. So the higher we get that original gravity, the more alcohol we get out of it at the end of the day. And uh, I still want it to have a little bit of residual sweetness just to balance out everything. Uh, I don't want it to be syrupy sweet, but I also don't want it to be too dry because then all the roasted grains are gonna contribute a pretty nasty acrid flavor. Given enough time to age though, that shouldn't be too much of a worry. But hopefully everything works out. Um, this is again a very complicated, very uh, difficult beer to get right. So hopefully I have an acceptable result here, um, but we're gonna see how it goes anyway. And uh, in six months or seven months, you'll find out. But uh, this is just the brew day portion of that. So um, yeah, let's get to it. I'm not sure if you can see this, but our strike water has reached its appropriate uh, calculated temperature. So we're gonna go ahead and turn off the heat stick and uh, put our bag in. All right, I already added brewing salts to this water a while ago, um, but now we're gonna go ahead and add the grain on go in. Even for a brew in a bag mash, this is actually really thick. I've had to break up a ton of dough balls already. 
Okay, so for our actual mash temperature, um, it is 151 right in the money. Look at that. It's time to wrap this up and uh, let it sit for 90 minutes. Okay, so here is my sample of work that I just pulled after about 10 minutes into the mash. Um, just gonna grab a quick pH estimate here. So to my eyes, this looks like it's about 5.5. So that's very good, that's exactly where we want to be. Uh, again, that is just an estimate because it's a pH strip. It's not super precise, but gets us what we need to know. Okay, it's been uh, 90 minutes, so now I'm going to go ahead and unwrap this and we'll take a final temperature reading. Alright, so the thermometer is reading about 146 degrees. Uh, so we did lose some temperature, um, which is to be expected with uh, this much grain like this is actually almost this is pretty much the consistency of a normal all grain mash at this point since the grain absorbed a lot of water very thick and now for the part that is uh not so fun for me but probably hilarious to you uh i get to pull this grain bag out uh which is now about three times the weight it was when it went in uh and let it drain so hopefully I don't make an enormous mess, but probably going to end up doing that again. Alright, so yeah, I made a big mess on the stove, but still, it's a crazy amount of grain. That's probably the largest grain bill I think I've worked with to date. Anyway, we're going to let this drain over time. And I'm going to go clean up the stove. So I hit my boil. Uh, it is time to add the bittering addition, which is an ounce and a quarter of Northern Brewer. And uh, this is a 60 minute boil. All right, we'll come back in 30 minutes for the 30 minute hop addition. Okay, so our pre-boil OG reading is in and it's about 1.072, which is great because uh, our estimated pre-boil OG was about 1.071, so. Pretty good start so far. That means that the beer is going to probably be pretty strong, uh, which is the goal. So we'll see how the rest of this goes, and uh, hopefully we can duplicate these results for the second beer. All right, so it has been 30 minutes since our 60-minute hop edition, so now it's time to add our 30-minute hop edition, which is just three-quarters of an ounce of Northern Brewer. So we're 15 minutes from the end of the boil and uh, it's time to add our third hop addition which is going to be half an ounce of Northern Brewer and three quarters of an ounce of East Kent Goldings. At this time I'm also going to add my chiller.
And I'm also going to add two and a half tablespoons of yeast nutrient. Okay, so we are now five minutes from the end of the boil, so it's time for our final hop addition, which is three quarters of an ounce of East Kent Goldens. So the boil's officially ended. I'm gonna go ahead and pull everything out and cut off all the heat. And I'm also gonna take an original gravity sample. So the boil's finished, um, and now we're just going to be cooling down the brew. Now because the uh, beer is actually so big, um, we actually want a tiny smidgen of diacetyl in this. So we're going to actually ferment a bit on the warmer side. Um, so I'm thinking what I'm going to do probably is cool this down to the appropriate temperature of about 60. You know, that's where we normally pitch yeast at. And then it'll raise up to 68 to 70 degrees, and then we'll ferment at that temperature steady for about two weeks or so. Maybe three weeks, depending on how long it takes to heat through all that sugar. And like I said, this is gonna happen a second time. Now, as I was brewing this beer today, I was kind of thinking, maybe it makes more sense for me, instead of trying to duplicate um, the exact same thing, for a second batch, maybe it makes more sense for me to kind of try and correct some of the uh, possible shortcomings of this brew. So I was thinking if, for example, my original gravity is lower than I wanted it to be, um, I don't know that yet because it's still cooling off, but if that were the case, then I could go ahead and brew a second batch with less volume but the same amount of ingredients, um, and that would give me a slight compensation for that. So I did perform my mash at a slightly lower temperature than one would expect for a stout, so it's possible that there's a thinner body as a result of that. So I could also compensate for that by mashing at a higher temperature with my second batch. Once these are fermented, they're going to go into secondary fermentation for uh, six or seven months. I mean, I'm not looking at bottling these beers until Christmas or New Year's. Um, and uh, at that point, I can blend the two together, and hopefully that beer will actually end up being a nice, perfect middle ground. So that's an option, or I could just go ahead and try to do the same thing all over again. It was an absolute beast of a beer to brew. I mean, there was a lot of attention needed and a lot of uh, actions basically taking place. So um, hopefully it's worth it. I love my Russian Imperial Stouts, and it'll be nice to have a good one. Hopefully it turns out that way. All right, so I'm kind of losing my mind right now because I just hit 1.100 for the first time uh, in all of my brewing uh, without using any sugars, without using any uh, dry malt extract. I managed to get a super high original gravity. I am so psyched right now. Um, what this means is that my Russian Imperial Stout brew day actually went really well. So here we are, at least batch one did. Um, <laughs> This is awesome for me. I am just, I'm just very happy because it means that I actually had a system work the way it was designed to. It means my efficiency losses aren't as much as I was expecting them to be. Um, and the brew just ended up being awesome as far as uh, doing what it was supposed to do. I know I'm kind of babbling right now, but I'm psyched. I'm, I love it. <laughs> so. Bottom line is though, we have a really, really good potential for this beer to turn out really well, um, at least from batch one. So I'm thinking I probably don't need to compensate anything in the second batch, uh, so I'm just gonna probably go ahead and brew the exact same beer. Um, maybe I might change the mash temperature just slightly, uh, just to try and increase the body, because I can't really figure out whether that's gonna work right now or not. 
But in the meantime, I know that my alcohol percentage and attenuation is going to be right on target for this beer. So that is awesome. Like we're in the nine, nine and a half percent range right now, I think, if it goes all the way down to where it's supposed to. So it's going to be a big one and I'm excited. All right, so the words cooled down and it's time to transfer over to the fermenter. Um, I'm going to go ahead and aerate this by splashing it in, which has always worked really well in the past. important to heavily aerate a really big beer like this. If you don't introduce enough oxygen, the yeast are simply not going to eat all the sugar. They're going to get very tired very quickly. So the more oxygen they have, the more they will be able to do their job, basically. But anyway, um, I got a good two and a half inches of foam on the top, so I'm going to say we're pretty good uh, as far as aeration goes. Now I'm going to go ahead and pitch my two packets of uh, rehydrated USO5. So I'm going to repeat this brew one more time, uh, sometime in the next couple weeks. i uh, just going to basically do pretty much the exact same recipe. I think that I'm satisfied with the results that I got today, so I can probably duplicate that again. Um, I'm going to transfer these over into secondary containers. I am not going to show any of that, but they're going into these little three gallon containers, so there's no headspace whatsoever. And then I'm basically going to age those for six plus months. Um, I'm hoping I can get past six or so, but I think it'll be about the holidays by the time I bottle this. Um, so because of that, I am going to go ahead and just publish this brew day video by itself. And I'll follow up with a tasting video in six or seven months or whenever these are done. Um, if you're watching in the future and that time has passed, then you'll see a card notification right up here that will direct you over to the tasting video if you want to see how this thing turned out. Um, I sure do right now, but I can't fast forward six or seven months now, can I? In the meantime, in the next couple weeks, I'm going to go ahead and brew the same exact recipe over once more um, and uh, do the exact same stuff. Okay, so today is the day that I'm going to be brewing my second batch of the Russian Imperial Stout. Uh, it's been two weeks since I brewed the first one, and the primary stage of fermentation is completed, and we have some really impressive results, actually. So, I had a final gravity, hopefully you can see that, of about 1.024. So I initially didn't really plan on putting that clip in the video because I just wanted it to be about the brewing, but uh, yeah, that was actually pretty solid fermentation. So it dropped from the original gravity of 1.100 down to a final gravity, at least after the first two weeks of 1.024 is about 10.3% alcohol by volume attenuation, which is very, very impressive for me because I used no sugar during that entire process. That is all from a single infusion brew in a bag mash. So there are haters out there, there are people that don't believe that it's a viable method of brewing, and this goes to show that you can still go ahead and get great results with it. As I age this for another six months or so, I'm actually expecting that gravity to drop a little bit further, maybe one or two more points. So I'll actually include a true final gravity at the end of the six months in my tasting video when that comes out. All right, so another good reason to go ahead and age things in bulk is because I particularly suck at being able to keep my hands off my beer as I let it age. This beer, as it is right now, two weeks in, tastes really good. Um, a little harsh up front because of all that roasted malt, but um, it has a really strong, nice chocolatey, woody, kind of deep, complex flavor that uh, honestly tastes very similar to a Yeti, I think. it's not. Not that same caliber, but uh, it's still a very solid example of a Russian Imperial Stout and will only continue to get better with age. So I need to make sure I'm really diligent about aging this. If I go ahead and bottle this now, it's definitely all going to be gone before too long. Uh, we don't want that, so 
I have to force myself to age it. Now, considering how good this is right now as the base beer, I'm strongly considering actually adding some adjuncts like oak or a little bit of cocoa um, to the second three gallon fermenter for this second batch that I'm making right now. If I can get the same exact numbers and results and consistency between these two batches, then I think it'd be actually really cool to have a variation on this uh, as a base beer. So I'm gonna think about that, considering that I have to put those adjuncts in only a couple days before bottling, that's not something that'll be covered in this video. You'll see that during the bottling video. Not only will I be brewing my second batch today, but I'm also going to be transferring my first batch off of the yeast cake into secondary fermentation. And as a result, I'm going to actually have that fresh yeast cake handy, so I'm going to pitch my uh, second batch wort straight onto that yeast cake from the first batch. And as a result, we should see some very fast, very vigorous, very efficient fermentation. Uh, this is a common technique that's used, but I've just never had a brew day line up with a transfer day before, so hopefully it works out real well. Um, so anyway, Feature Me is going to go ahead and edit this part and show you what the numbers were for the uh, second batch compared to the first batch. So here is the temperature change over the course of the mash for my first batch and for my second batch. And here is the mash pH for batch 1 and batch 2. Okay, here is the pre-boil OG reading for my first batch and my second batch. Okay, here is the actual original gravity reading for my first batch and my second batch. I will update the tasting video with the final gravities once those are relevant. So if you like this video, please consider dropping a like, uh, comment, let me know what you think. Uh, especially if you decide to try and brew this one, because based on how this is right now, uh, I really do think it's going to be a winner. So if you like watching me brew and do these things, please consider actually subscribing to the channel. There's a little bell notification icon down there you can click, so that way you'll see a little notification on your phone or YouTube channel page uh, that'll tell you when I upload a new video. I usually try to upload a video roughly every month, sometimes more frequently if I can manage it, but as you know as well as I do, life gets in the way sometimes. Thank you to my current subscribers. Uh, I really appreciate all your support over this time and let me know what you think about these videos. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and brew the second batch of this beer, so I will catch you in the next one. Cheers.